So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sutkashwani Krishna. I'm the vice chair for the IEEE Microwave Theory and Technic Society Santa Clara Valley Chapter or MTTSCV. Uh, welcome to the technical presentation for the month of August 2020. Uh, the title of which is what is my measurement equipment actually doing? The implications for 5G millimeter wave and related applications. Uh, our speaker today is MTTS uh, Distinguished Microwave Lecturer and Engineering Fellow at Enritsu, Dr. John Martins. Uh, welcome, John. We are very uh, fortunate to have you. It's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, before we go on to the actual talk, uh, just a few things to note. This meeting is being recorded and also it's being broadcast live on both Zoom as well as Facebook Live. Links to the video and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Uh, please keep your cameras and micro uh, cameras off and microphones muted to help with bandwidth issues and background noise. Uh, please post your questions in the chat window to everyone. One of our officers will monitor the chat window and we'll be taking breaks every 20 minutes or so to answer them. Uh, also, uh, please ensure that your display name in Zoom, if that's the platform you're using, matches the one you use to register. This will make it easy for us to check you in and keep records. Uh, if you did not register and were forwarded this link, uh, please send Utkarsh and Krishna, that's uh, myself, a private chat message in Zoom with your name and email address so that I can register and check you in. Uh, please support us by becoming a member Join IEEE and MTTS if you haven't already. Uh, uh, it's only with your support that we can continue to bring you these talks. So uh, if you haven't joined yet, please consider joining. Also, uh, please follow us on LinkedIn uh, using the hashtag MTTSCV. That way you can get access to any announcements we make from our channel at the moment we make it. Keep track of any future events and so on. Uh, the agenda for today, uh, or the rest of the slide set, we'll be looking at some COVID-19 updates, uh, followed by uh, the officers for the two uh, uh, societies. Uh, I forgot to mention, uh, this talk is actually a joint talk. It's co-sponsored by the IEEE Circuits and Systems Society, as well as MTTS. So we'll be looking at uh, who are the officers for these two chapters, uh, after which we will go on to an introduction to our speaker and today's talk. Uh, as far as COVID-19 uh, updates, uh, all our in-person meetings uh, uh, organized by our chapter are canceled and we're holding only uh, online or webinar format meetings such as this one. To introduce the two chapters, I would now like to call upon our uh, chairman, Mr. Jay Banwit. So Jay. Thank you, Akash. <clears throat> Actually, my power just went out on my computer and was able to get back in about a couple of seconds before you uh, introduced me. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, as Utkash said, uh, this is a joint uh, uh, presentation uh, by the Circuit and uh, System Society, as well as the MTTS, the Microwave Theory and Transactions. Um, as Utkash mentioned, I'm the chair, Jay Banwade. Uh, Vice Chair is uh, Utkash Yuri Krishna. Uh, Secretary is Pan Tui and uh, Treasurer is Tom McKay. Next slide. Um, our sister chapter, uh, Circuits and System Society, um, the Chair is Zimran Bashir, the Vice Chair Amit Ja, and the Secretary is George Chen. Next. So as, uh, as Utkash mentioned, uh, we are honored to have Dr. John Martin as the uh, presenter for this uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, John Martin has been uh, with Enritsu since 1995, where he is currently an engineering fellow. He's also a distinguished microwave lecturer of, uh, of the MTTS class of 2020-2022. His research interests include measurement system architecture and pathologies, millimeter wave circuit and system design, and a wide range of microwave measurement processes to include material analysis, nonlinear and quasi linear characterization, optical interaction and calibration. He is also the inventor or co-inventor on over 17 patents 
and has co-authored several book chapters and over 50 technical publications. Dr. Martin is past chair of the MTT Measurement Technical Subcommittee and is a past president of the Measurement Society, ARPTAG, and is still active in both. He is a member of the Technical Program Subcommittee for the International Microwave Symposium and ARPTAG, and is a former associate director, excuse me, associate editor for the transaction on uh, microwave theory and transactions, microwave theory and techniques. So, okay. Um, today's presentation, as was mentioned, is uh, titled What is my measurement equipment actually doing? Implication for 5G, millimeter wave, and related applications. Um, the abstract is, uh, I'm sure you folks have already read it, but uh, let me just quickly go through it. It's uh, The abstract is current microwave and high frequency instrumentation for many tasks behind the scenes, even more so in the millimeter wave and high modulation rate regimes pertinent to near and upcoming communication standards and other applications. And it's easy to lose track of how the equipment, the processing, out, the processing algorithms, the setup and the signals are interacting. By exploring the measurement mechanics within some common instruments under practical consider, uh, conditions, it may be easier to understand where sensitivities or anomalies uh, might increase and how to mitigate them. Through a study of example architecture and measurements, including those in the 100 gigahertz range, and those with uh, wide modulation bandwidths where linearity, dynamic range, and other physical metrics are stressed, even more mechanisms and ideas for better measurements will be explored. So with, uh, next slide. So without further ado, I think that's our last slide. Uh, let me present uh, Dr. John Mark. John, if you want to share your screen. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. At, uh... But, uh, so gosh, are you... Go ahead. Uh, hold on. Let me fix that. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Sorry about that. But thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Looking forward to it. We're honored to have you, John. Thank you. Okay, guys, give me just one second here. I'll need to figure out. Uh, can you share? Can you try again, John? Uh, no. Oh, no, because I'm looking at the options and it says uh, everybody should be able to share. It's interesting. With gosh, do you have the slide set? I don't, but uh, if you can send that to me, John, maybe that's because it says here it should be, you should be able to share it and we've never had this problem before. So not sure. Let's just, let's just have a backup plan just in case it doesn't work yep. out. Okay. 
So Jay, uh, can you try sharing? Do you have the same problem? I'm just curious. Hoping that's visible. Uh, yep. <laughs> All right. Again, thank you for, for the invitation to speak today and, and thank MTT for, for sponsoring the DML program. And as many talks in, in the last several years, we have to have this obligatory little chart of spectrum uh, as, as 5G and 6G communication standards are certainly uh, very important in, in development today. Uh, but in, in particular, there, there are some aspects of it I wanna focus on. The, the obvious ones, of course, are wider instantaneous bandwidths um, to 400 megahertz in, in FR2 for 5G currently, and wider ones promised for, for future editions. And modest millimeter wave frequencies, at least for now, uh, up to 52 gigahertz in the 3GPP standard, and certain 6G proposals are well into the terahertz range, at least from a regulatory point of view. Um, Let's so wait to see it when, when and if those get implemented. Uh, some relatively stringent adjacent channel power requirements in, in part of, of some of the 5G specifications and stringent from a measurement point of view as much as anything. And then not so much part of the standards, but just a, a practicality as integration levels increase is the larger number of over the air test requirements and how that impacts particularly things like measurement repeatability. Uh, and calibrations. If we broaden the scope to other millimeter wave applications, uh, such as local distribution, uh, there's a certain amount of work going on and uh, well above 200 gigahertz even in some of these uh, nicer lower loss atmospheric windows or relatively lower loss. Uh, some interesting aspects, at least in some of this work is relatively high power levels, at least compared to what has been done in those frequency ranges. And as at lower frequency ranges, the consideration of linearity and the presence of, of wideband interferers is important. A millimeter wave imaging and radar has been in a lot of research areas and some commercial areas recently for the obvious benefits of resolution. And that presents some sometimes severe noise requirements, both for the devices being made and the measurement equipment to look at them. And underlying all of these applications is just device development where wideband models are needed, not just to cover the specific application frequency ranges, but perhaps harmonics um, for nonlinear analysis, uh, perhaps mixing products of some modulation energy. And in, in other words, a, more than just a narrow swath of frequency has to be covered in, in the model development and with a lot of different measurements of interest. So if one sort of collapses all these things down onto the, the measurement implications. There are well, some obvious things, the, the frequencies, of course. And we talked about the measurement media and the characterization. And one that isn't talked about as much sometimes is, is the needed uncertainties in those measurements, although much more so currently than a few years ago. And that's the obvious case that if the if you require too tight and uncertainty in the measurement, you'll spend too much energy on test protocols and equipment. And if it's too loose or required uncertainty, your end device may not, may not fulfill your needs. So the, the talk we're gonna break down into some classical sort of equipment types that most of you are probably very familiar with. And the little subplot in this, in this whole talk, which I'll reveal now is there's less of a distinction between these categories than there once was, and the trend is probably uh, continuing in that direction. But we'll start off with network analysis as, as one of them. And you may be very familiar with this kind of block diagram where there's a one or more stimulus sources, usually just a sinusoid, maybe switched, there may just be lots of sources some signal separation devices to pull off an incident and reflected and transmitted signals, some down converters to generate these A and B waves that can be digitized, and then some calibration is applied to take out loss in cables, mismatch in the VNA itself and, and other variables. So just gonna spend a few minutes looking at how some of these uh, piece parts are trending as we, we go to higher frequency measurements. And one of those is, is the directional devices, which may be a directional coupler, it doesn't have to be, 
can be a resistive splitter in, in some cases. And this hasn't tended to be a limiting factor too much as we move to millimeter wave measurements. The, the technology's kept up pretty well. And just an example here is a, a broadband coupler intended to cover about 30 to 220 gigahertz. And the coupling factor is higher than the undesired isolation or the uncoupled direction over all that range, which is sort of what you'd, you'd like to have most of the time. Um, but that, that again, hasn't been, been that much of, of a limiting factor in, in terms of how it reacts with stability and certainly not direct uncertainties. The sources themselves are, are a little more interesting in that historically in the, in the network analysis universe, signal purity was not the highest priority. Uh, and for small signal loss parameters, that makes a certain amount of sense in that you know what frequency you're measuring at um, and you're not likely to, to put the DUT into some unknown operating state. But that's been changing as a wider variety of measurements are being demanded of the instrumentation, like harmonics and intermodulation distortion. But also if you're driving this device in a quasi-linear way, then too much harmonic energy can alter its bias point and cause, cause other issues. What that means from a millimeter wave point of view is, is controlling harmonics and subharmonics in particular it gets to be a bit more of a challenge uh, since switched filters get very lossy and, and present some problems. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on in, in that area to control those. Another aspect of the transmit side, I guess, so to speak, is power control. And that may be for something as simple as a swept power gain compression kind of measurement, which is sort of shown a little graph in the, in the lower right. But it may just be you want some reasonable control of power at a pretty low level as uh, fine dimension transistors may compress at minus 40, minus 50 dBm or, or sometimes less. Uh, so just having accurate control there is important. And how one has to do that sort of changes a bit with frequency as well. If one looks at this little diagram, which is really just a, a leveling loop with a lot of different added things in it. Uh, there's, if you focus on the, the far right, there may be some kind of coupled detector, uh, some amplification, maybe logging, uh, difference nodes, some integration, and that feeds into some variable uh, attenuator, or variable gain amp, whatever, to complete a negative feedback loop. And that works fine at, in principle at all frequencies. The trouble if one tries to do this directly, say in the hundreds of gigahertz is with a single detection scheme like this is the amount of noise energy you're integrating over that bandwidth can just swamp your available detection range. Uh, so that can be a, a challenge to get good power control as well as the, the sensitivity of the detectors over that, that kind of range can be varying and per perhaps limited. So some techniques that are used are essentially to move the detection to other places. One could put it before a final multiplier, which certainly makes it easier from a, a noise point of view, but now you have to account for any drift in this multiplier over time, uh, as well as its slope, of course. And another approach, which one is seeing more at millimeter wave frequencies is a heterodyne detection kind of, kind of a scheme that allows you to control the noise and energy uh, in, a, in a tighter bandwidth and get, and get better power control. If one moves over to the receiver, uh, one challenge here, of course, is, is getting a, a decent noise figure since you have this coupling loss right in the front. So it doesn't make things easy from a classical receiver design point of view. Uh, there may be oh, an LNA. It does have to be broadband for these applications, very good linearity, that's fine. Uh, there may be some switched attenuation or maybe even switched gain, depending on, on the system. A uh, couple of, of challenges there in that because this is towards the front end, it ten any changes in these gain states will tend to affect input match as well as, uh, of course, transmission. So you may need a new calibration for every state. Uh, so that can be a bit painful. And of course, at higher and higher frequencies, the through insertion loss of, of any kind of switch structure like that can get to be significant. So that tends to be a bit less common above uh, say the 100 gigahertz kind of realm. Focusing next on, on just the down converter itself, um, certainly lower frequencies, just a fundamental 
mixer is, is of course common as in any, any other transceiver design. Uh, but at, at the, the higher millimeter wave frequencies, that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, creating an, a fundamental LO with good noise performance over 100 gigahertz is a bit of a challenge. And even if you're using some multipliers, getting all of that filtering exactly right, um, uh, takes cost, takes power. And finally, in a multi-channel receiver, such as a network analyzer where an LO might be shared, the isolation between paths can, can be a bit of a challenge. So as in an awful lot of other millimeter wave transceivers, a subharmonic kind of scheme is, is not uncommon. And it could be a direct subharmonic conversion, this factor J, or there could be some incomplete filtering with an external multiplier, this factor K doesn't really matter here. The impact of that, of course, is a number of receiver windows will exist uh, where noise energy present at the port will convert to the IF at some of these other, I guess, harmonically related positions. Uh, so that'll degrade noise performance a bit more as well as open one up for, for some spurious responses. And another impact of, of that, of course, is on the linearity of, of that converter. And, and that ends up being pretty important for you know, some of the quasi-linear measurements we talked about earlier. And a, a couple of example plots here um, of two different systems, one about 110 gigahertz broadband instrument and another in the 330 to 500 gigahertz range. And these are third order intercept products, so a good or at least a classical linearity metric. And while a comparison between these isn't entirely fair because the technologies are different, you can see numerically there is, is a drop of the intercept product with frequency. And that shouldn't be too surprising, at least intuitively, since the breakdown voltages are gonna drop in the uh, converter elements just from feature size. And that tends to be a, a fairly dominant linearity factor in these in these converters. From a practical point of view, it isn't that dire a situation since typically there are lower drive amplitudes at the higher frequencies as well. So the the net uncertainty impact may be a, a bit of a wash. So how do these get implemented in practice? And one may already be using these kind of structures where you have millimeter wave modules attached to some microwave VNA. So a common approach for, well, for certain just practical logistical reasons, but it also valuably gets the test port out very close to the DUT or to the wafer probe or, or the final structure. So you don't have uh, a crazy amount of loss between the instrument port and, and the device, which of course impacts dynamic range and impacts stability and other things. Uh, since even at 100 gigahertz, uh, three, four dB for 10 centimeters of, of cabling is, is not unusual, uh, if not higher than that. And even waveguide losses in the couple hundred gigahertz range aren't insignificant. The, we talked a, about, a lot about the, the LO structure before, and that's going to be another recurring theme as we go along here, in that you have these, these fairly substantial multipliers in some cases, and particularly when you get to the terahertz range, these num LO multipliers may be on the scale of 30, 40, 50, uh, or something like that. And of course, phase noise tends to, tends to multiply with, with that multiplication factor. And you can indeed see some effects. And the, the graph on the lower right here is sort of the impact of injecting uh, some LO noise, wideband noise, uh, admittedly. And there's looking at the conversion efficiency of this harmonic uh, converter up front. So we're not looking at noise figure or anything even remotely subtle. We're just looking at conversion efficiency. And you notice when you get to a high enough noise injection level, the conversion just collapses. And a I guess one way of thinking about that is, is more in the time domain where the converter is a, a switching element. And that switching transition has been so fuzzed by the noise injection that it, it really doesn't create two proper states. And so that uh, behooves one then to, to pay attention to the, the LO chain, which all the instrument folks have to think about. And if you're creating these down converters yourselves for, a, uh, for your own 
um, test equipment, that's, that's certainly something that's important. Now, if, if one wants a, a broadband kind of scheme, not just say a waveguide band up at 100 or 200 gigahertz, there are broadband systems around. And typically those are constructed with some kind of multiplexing scheme, although uh, switching can be used in, in some cases. And this is just a sketch of, of one such approach where both the stimulus multiplication is just multiplexed onto a main line. And then a couple of different receiver systems are multiplexed just by nature of their couplers. And that allows you to have the central conductor that's, that's a DC path. Uh, so it gets, allows a low freak, allows biasing and a few other things. Uh, but the, the advantage of, of this kind of approach, particularly in an on-wafer uh, kind of situation, is not having to change modules and probes as you try to cover wider frequency ranges. And then there's calibrations, which everyone who's, who's used VNA has been uh, forced to deal with and sometimes not happy about having to deal with it. And really what's what happening here is there are imperfections some are sort of obvious like cable loss to the DUT, but others are behind the scenes such as mismatch within the VNA, frequency response slope within the VNA and so on. And the whole premise is that if you have some known standards you can connect out here at these reference planes, you can solve for the behaviors back here and, and remove them. And this has been a, a cottage industry uh, for many decades actually. And, you probably recognize this alphabet soup of different algorithms that are available, uh, which just to make uh, everything more confusing, there isn't a lot of consistency on what the letters and the acronyms stand for, uh, or, and there are multiple names for the same algorithm. And I won't be able to deconvolve all of this uh, today, but there are a couple of simple points I wanna make, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the uh, higher frequency measurements. And open short load is, is probably the calibration method people are most familiar with. And it has some friends uh, based on offset shorts in a load or just offset shorts. And the premise of these techniques is you tell the instrument exactly what the S parameters are of each standard. And the instrument will do, do what it has to to reproduce those values it's told. So as a, as a sidebar, that makes using one of these standards as a verification device not terribly productive since the VNA is just going to try to reproduce what it was told. Um, but anyway, a, the historical method of, of defining, say, this short was a, a simple circuit model. Um, for example, an offset inductance uh, for each standard, frequency dependent inductance, admittedly. Um, but that causes some problems in, in the higher frequencies since a, just a simple transmission line plus an inductor doesn't do a real good job of describing a standard that's getting on the scale of a wavelength and size. So a, a more recent approach has been to provide tabular S parameters versus frequency, which could be from uh, transfer calibration measurements that the manufacturer does it could be from EM simulations. It could be from a combination of those. And that, that can make an accuracy difference. And the plot on the lower right is a measurement of a verification device, but you can view the amount of ripple in that chart as, as a metric of one component of uncertainty. So less ripple is better. And the, the dashed curve is the old approach where inductance was specified as a polynomial in frequency. And the S1P, as you can guess from the file name extension, is a, is a tabular form. Another popular family of calibrations is the through reflect line group, which you've probably heard of as well. And this is a family that's based on ideality of transmission lines, um, where it's assumed when you have two line lengths, the only difference between those S parameters should be something related to the propagation constant times the length difference. So really what that means is the impedances of those lines are the same and you can launch to them in the same way. That's where this method can run into a little bit of trouble if you have a low repeatability environment, the launching parasitics aren't consistent. And in, in that case, the TRL family has, has some problems, but 
in more controlled environments, it's probably as the lowest uncertainties of, of most of the calibration methods. And more recently, there's been a variant on that, um, which is bringing the calibration more, slightly more into the statistical realm, where you use a lot of transmission lines. And then you get some immunity from, say, a repeatability error or one line having an odd characteristic impedance or something like that. In that the, in, in a least squares sense, the optimal solution from all the data is, is what to solve for. And so that's particularly in the metrology world on wafer, that is a extremely popular technique. And one little set of examples is shown here in the lower left is just using a, a basic two transmission line calibration. And a calibration was done 10 times and the same device was measured after each cal. And this is just a scatter in that particular data. So you see a couple of little areas where there's some divergence, which in this case happened to be um, the touchdown to one of the lines was a little problematic because of the of some pad damage. This is an on-wafer kind of measurement. But the same approach was done with a four-line kind of calibration, and, and the divergence was, was noticeably less in that case. So this is a a moving trend in the, in the higher frequency calibration world. The downside being, of course, you need more standards. Moving to the a more slightly more practical world where you have a, a test fixture where you have to connect your device. Uh, this can present a bit more of a challenge since at this DUT plane in the middle, it may not be a, a terribly high repeatability range if it's a, a spring points or uh, some kind of pin contact. But still, you want to move the reference planes into that inner plane. And there are a number of ways of doing that, and that's been a significant development in the last few years, is how to characterize these, these fixtures in a, in a convenient way that's, that's sufficiently accurate for measuring things like, well, fixtures that are up to 100, 110 gigahertz in this, this little, little shot here. And one approach that's led to a number of different algorithms is to add some assumptions about the fixture to reduce the stress on the standards at this reference plane. And those assumptions might be symmetry. Uh, they can be where is the mismatch located, for example, is it only at these launch points? And taking advantage of that information can let you reduce some of the stress on, on both repeatability and on what the standards have to do. Moving to the other media problem we talked about earlier, uh, over the air, um, where you're trying to calibrate with a free space path as being your transmission line, uh, opens up some other interesting, interesting challenges. And one first question is, what's the path loss? And that'll be dependent on how large your spacing is and, and everything else, of course, antenna gain levels. Um, but if these losses are high enough, a lot of the things you would normally have to correct for, like mismatch interactions, uh, become a lot less important. Uh, so you might get lucky and just a normalization kind of calibration is all that's needed. And for example, for a lot of antenna pattern measurements and certain beam configuration measurements, that works just fine. But for smaller ranges, mismatch can come back into play. And as you might expect, just using a normalization can lead to a fair amount of ripple, which is where what this blue curve is in the middle. But if you look a little more carefully at this curve, you'll notice there's a, a, a couple of different spatial frequency things going on in it. There's a, obviously the, the high frequency ripple in here, but then there's some lower frequency thing going on here. And really what that comes from is a couple of different path length differences uh, uh, causing mismatch variances. And many of the calibration methods at Alphabet Soup we, we looked at earlier um, will all work when you do have to think about match. Uh, but one, one method is, is reasonably popular in that space. And that's the, the line reflect uh, match algorithm. And it's a little counterintuitive at first how these standards are arrived at. But if you think about it, a uh, line, that's sort of easy. It's, you're pointing your two antennas at each other. A reflect could be a short, that's just a metal plate uh, normal to the path. Uh, 
and an important point about this, this algorithm family is you don't really need to know much about this reflect standard. It's not like short open load where you have to tell it the S parameters. Uh, it's really just sort of requires the reflect be symmetric is really the important thing there. So you can be a little bit sloppy with this standard and not take a big uncertainty hit. And the match, while well, you could put an absorber in here to take care of it, actually if you're in a chamber and the walls are reasonably absorptive, if you just tilt this plate at a 45 degree angle, uh, you're really getting no reflection into the antenna. Um, and that works reasonably well as, as a match standard. If we sort of throw all these things together at, and try to get a bigger picture of overall uncertainties, I mean, here are some of the, the common mechanisms. Uh, noise floor and trace noise, and although we didn't talk about it too much here, they don't tend to get worse that rapidly as we go higher and higher in frequency. Uh, they do a bit, as, but the technologies are, are keeping pace, so those aren't degrading uh, too fast. Uh, residual calibration errors, how well do you know your standards is really what that boils down to. And that isn't getting fast very dramatically either. Uh, linearity we, we mentioned, it is getting worse in absolute terms, but not so much in net terms. And I'll show a curve in a minute to explore that a little more. And what does get worse a little more rapidly are things in the area of repeatability and drift. And a little example here on repeatability, just related to connectors, is shown here in the bottom. And the picture on the left is a reflection measurement using coax. This is a 0.8 millimeter connector, so up to 145 gigahertz. And a device was measured. It was connected and disconnected a thousand times and then measured again. And the difference in dB terms, vector difference in dB terms, is just plotted here, so somewhere in the 50s. And that's a little bit worse than lower microwave frequencies. You know, somewhere in the 40 gigahertz range, you might be in the mid 60s, but uh, that's numerically, that's, that's fairly common. But over on the right is a waveguide measurement. Now this is higher frequency, um, but a factor of five higher. Same kind of concept where we just disconnect and reconnect, but this was only six times. And you'll notice, and it's the same metric, but you'll notice the numbers creeping up into the 20s. And that's, that's pretty significant. And that's gonna swamp all these other uncertainty terms. Now this is with a, a classic waveguide flange, which was designed many, many years ago with dimensional tolerances that were more appropriate for lower frequencies. Uh, so in recent years, there have been new standard flanges developed. Uh, P1785 is the name of one such standard uh, to help improve those, those repeatability numbers. So if one combines these to figure out a net transmission magnitude uncertainty, and this is a really simple model, it's plotted here. But we have the transmission of the device you're trying to measure on the x-axis and uncertainty, of course, on, on the y. For a couple of systems, our 110 gig system and our 500 gig banded system over here. And you'll notice a, a few things structurally. Uh, there's this central asymptote and things that go into that are you know, calibration terms we talked about, which aren't too significant here, but also repeatability and drift, which tend not to be too level sensitive. And so that's gotten a bit worse. I can see that just from the, the scale. Uh, this lower corner is really determined when the noise floor takes over. And if you look at the level at which noise floor is adding about a half dB of uncertainty, okay, that's moved up a bit, maybe from you know, minus 85, minus 90 to somewhere in the minus 75 dB range. So, okay, it moved a little bit. And the upper corner is from compression and while we showed earlier that the absolute intercept point might have gotten worse, for these two systems, the default power is a lot lower at the higher frequency. So that's sort of where that, that, that wash came into play. If we focus a little more on, on our over the air problem, then the repeatability is, is now a lot more of a mechanical issue. And just as one little example of that, suppose we're measuring an array, and this is an end shot of it as a little green rectangle. And we're just trying to measure, let's say, the phase transfer through each element of this array. But 
we didn't mount it quite right. So it's tilted relative to the measurement, uh, measurement antenna by the little black arrow. And this, suppose we're doing this at 38 gigahertz, so one of the FR2 frequency ranges. If we're off by a tenth of a millimeter, the added phase error is a few degrees, so you've roughly doubled the total phase uncertainty budget uh, in this, this measurement, which isn't, isn't too terrible. But if we've gone to a half millimeter, now you've had almost 20 degrees of phase uncertainty when you're at the end of the array, which is, of course, the worst case uh, position from that. Uh, so that's pretty significant. And you sort of swamped all the other uncertainty terms when, when you've done that. Another challenge uh, can be multipath. Um, if you think about our, our cartoon of a chamber in the upper right here, and you're radiating a signal from the device, there's going to be some reflection off this not perfect absorber on the walls and this mounting jig may have some reflection associated with it. Uh, so these multiple paths can all arrive at the receive antenna but with different delays. Uh, so you can get some ripple structure which is really what's shown in, in blue. And the fortunately they, they do have different time delays so that you, you can foresee there's there might be some amelioration methods available here. And indeed there are the classical VNA time domain techniques where you transform the time domain, isolate out the part you care about, throw away the rest, and then transform back to the freak domain. And that's really what's shown here in gray. So you can take care of a fair number of problems assuming these multipaths are A, sufficiently different in distance, and B, you have enough sweep range, you can get enough resolution out of that since resolution goes as one over the, the sweep range. Uh, so that de device is sort of narrow band that presents a bit of a challenge. There are some, some other approaches where if you have enough modulation bandwidth on these devices, you can actually gate the acquisition and, and do the kind of same kind of time separation, but physically. Now I'll dive a little bit more into the measuring in the far field. Well, this certainly isn't an antenna talk, but there's a, some interesting handling of measurement data I want to, want to get to here. And the objective is, is usually to want to be able to measure in the far field since you can make a plane wave assumption at that place and analysis of the data gets a lot simpler. But for larger devices and higher frequencies, that distance required gets pretty large and it may not be practical, may not have a large enough chamber or a large enough setup area to do that. Uh, so one approach is a, a compact range, and these are extremely popular, where a reflector, which is shown by the number four here, um, parabolic or some other curved surface that creates a plane wave area near the DUT, uh, can place you out effectively at this range. The downside is it can only hold that plane wave construct over a, a finite dimension. So it does put some more constraints on the dot size. So another approach is to actually measure in the near field, which is a much smaller distance, and then apply some transformations to get the, the equivalent far field result. Um, but that does place some constraints on the underlying data and that's where I want to spend a minute or two looking at. And there are many ways of doing that kind of transformation, but some of them look basically like a two-dimensional Fourier transform, where this E sub i is some kind of field quantity which we'll, we'll take to be linearly related to some S parameters. And we'll transform it uh, spatially to get the, the far field result. But an interesting question is, okay, I've got some uncertainty in this measurement of my S parameters. How is that going to affect the transform result? And a parallel problem to that is if the instrument time domain I talked about earlier, where you're taking the freak domain data and going into time, the same kind of question rises. What do my uncertainties look like in time domain in that case? And so we can look at this, this integration and suppose we just had random or oscillatory errors on this E sub i. And if the scaling is right, they're just gonna average out. So the sensitivity, you wouldn't expect to be very high at all. On the other hand, if there are some spatially monotonic errors, and this could come from 
uh, stage mechanical accuracy, or cable flex if it uniformly bends or unbends as we move from one part of the setup to another. One could see the phase changing monotonically with space. This integration is going to tend to accentuate that that kind of kind of error, and you'd expect some high sensitivities. And then there are those where that just pass through the integration um, unaffected. Uh, for example, if two polarizations are needed to create this this E sub I, and our receivers are not calibrated the same way, those kind of things will pass through directed. And this falls into the, the whole category of, of correlated uncertainties. And what's happening here is if the uncertainty in two different positions is correlated like our cable flex, you can tend to see some, some expanded effects in the outcome. And that's been a, a big area of work in, in the measurement world for, for a few years now. But let's look at a, a little numerical example. Here in the upper left, we have uh, some raw near field collected data. This is just amplitude. And in the upper right, we have the transform result. So, okay, that's fine. But now we're going to add some noise, which could be from uh, trace noise. It could be from signal to noise ratio if the path losses are, are large enough. Um, and it's a lot of noise since this is a linear scale. There's a lot going on here. But if you look at the transform result, not much changed. And the eyeball comparison is, is reasonably fair in this case since both, both scales are linear. But now if we add a, a monotonic error in phase in one axis, which could be the, the mechanism we talked about before, you see some, some pretty significant distortions. The, we've got some broadening in one dimension. The peak amplitude is much lower than we started. And from a, just looking at the incoming data, if you only looked at magnitude, you wouldn't think anything was wrong at all. Uh, but the transformed result was, was quite a ways off. So to pull all of all the over the air things together in one little example, and at least along the lines of what needs to be considered, uh, suppose we have a, an array like shown here where there's some magnitude and phase adjust and maybe some power amplifier per element. And we want to you know, measure gain, measure phase, uh, measure distortion perhaps. Uh, and we want to be efficient about it in a, in a test way. So some of the calibration considerations, um, what are the path losses? We sort of talked about that. And what are the mismatch levels, uh, say, of this device or of the instrument? Uh, so you can work those against each other. That'll help you determine how, how significant a calibration you're going to need. And then something we'll, we'll return to a little bit later, but what frequency range do we care about? If we have a say a fairly sparse set of carrier frequencies, but a wide modulation bandwidth we want to analyze over, we may need a denser frequency list than one might initially thought to cover that. Since if you have large length scales involved in a few hundred megahertz or even gigahertz of mod bandwidth, uh, the point density requirements are, are going to be larger. What are the instrument requirements? Well, noise floor and linearity are the obvious ones. That the path loss comes back into that. What is the transmit power over here, of course? If for test efficiency reasons, we're going to be stimulating all of these elements at once, let's say at different frequencies so we can quickly rat ratchet through them, how linear is this instrument multiple carriers present? Um, that isn't something that's, that's easily specified. It might need to be characterized separately. And of course, the, the bandwidth that's, that's required. And along the, the setup considerations, how are you driving the elements if they are more than one's being driven at once? Are they all being driven at high power? Are they being driven coherently? And the reason that can come up is if there's a lot of coupling between elements, you might get some synthetic load pole going on, which, which can affect the results as well. That sort of leads us over into a, or a little transition over into the, the nonlinear uh, measurements. And we, we talked about the instrument linearity before. That isn't a surprise. But some trends certainly at lower frequency is full waveform acquisition, where for particularly for maximum power amplifier efficiency, um, getting a particular waveform shape is, is critical. And that hasn't appeared yet. 
at least to my knowledge in the in the higher millimeter wave range uh, if for no other reason it's it's really hard to generate that much harmonic power uh, given the ft of a technology that's being used say for a 60 gigahertz amplifier or something like that uh, but there's certainly um, you can see papers starting to show up where that kind of approach is being considered and that will eventually be more of interest. Where that comes down to in the, the measurement hardware point of view is particularly getting at harmonic phase. Uh, since being able to measure that is critical to being able to line up a, a complete uh, waveform. And the another fallout from, from anonymity analysis might be, well, should I be measuring all of my network parameters modulated? And the, the obvious thought is, well, maybe if I need to do it quasi-linearly because of the whole uh, peak to average power kind of concept, which probably everyone's familiar with. Um, but where does, where does one draw the line between network and signal analysis? And you know, probably the answer is it's hard to tell. Um, but let's consider from the network side anyway, where, well, let's create a modulated source. That seems easy enough. Uh, if I do have my set of reflectometers talked about before, I can still do some kind of match correction. If I have a reference available, I can do some ratioing, which in the next slide we'll see why that might actually be handy. Um, but then the the frequency list mentioned earlier is is of course also important again. That let's say the carrier frequencies I care about are maybe only spaced by a gigahertz or so but I've got this pretty wide modulation bandwidth in between. I may need to calibrate on this sub list in between each one. So a, a dual list kind of, kind of frequency approaches is sometimes considered. Uh, so what about that ratioing and, and leveling kind of concept? If one was just doing signal analysis, one wouldn't think that'd be important. And, and it may not be all the time, uh, but suppose in this, Earlier slide, we had some driver preamp. And suppose that's drifting around a little bit. Um, that could impact both the measurement and what the device is doing. And, and that's really what this, this slide is showing. If I just treat it as a native single channel kind of measurement and I came back two hours later, what actually happened in this case is the drive power drifted up by a couple of dB in band. This is a multi-sign uh, kind of stimulus. But in doing so, that actually pushed the device into a, a more nonlinear state. So you see the adjacent channel uh, things creeping up. Whereas I have a locally leveled and ratioed kind of signal that could have been counterbalanced by the system. So the drive level stayed consistent and you didn't get that uh, change in particularly an adjacent channel that was pretty significant. Um, what kind of measurements can you do with that kind of structure? Well, we could look at, at gain compression and phase distortion versus drive that, that may be of interest. And of course, one can compare to a CW sinusoidal measurement, which is really what's going on here. And not surprisingly, it's a modulated uh, signal. So it appears to be more compressed, even though the average powers are the same, uh, just because the peak powers are not the same. The, the zones are essentially pulling out portions of the modulation bandwidth and isolating how compression is behaving in each of those. And doing that, that separation of full nonlinear modeling sense is, is something of interest as well. And one can see why if, if one looks at the phase distortion versus power, uh, we're actually deviated a fair amount for those two different zones within the modulation bandwidth. Casting that in slightly different terms, just looking at a, a P1dB point versus carrier frequency. So the plotting is a little bit different. And of course, if you do it with CW stimulus, the results are, well, different. Um, but what's shown in the lower part of the graph are these zone compression points again, but with and without match correction is really the difference here. So if one compares, let's say the blue line to the green triangles, the, the thing of note really is the discrepancy between those two is not constant with frequency. And what that correlated to in this particular case was the match of the DUT wasn't constant with frequency. And another place where that match correction can show up is in the phase through the passband. 
and that's what's plotted here in the, in the lower picture, where a, a simple normalization cal showed a fair amount of phase variation in band. Uh, so if one just looked at that data in a native sense, one might think, wow, there, there could be a lot of uh, group play distortions. So there might be higher EVM for, for that particular part. Uh, but in this case, it was more just a, a measurement defect that would have led to that conclusion. Well, shifting more officially now into signal analysis, what is different architecturally? And historically, there was, there was quite a lot, and certainly lower frequencies there still is, um, where there's usually more conversion stages to reduce spurious content, which you really are looking for an unknown signal, typically. There was pre-selection, some variable filtering up front, again, for spur removal and for linearity assistance and some other reasons. Uh, there may have been some of the variable gain we talked about earlier, and that's certainly true. Going towards millimeter wave, there tends to be a bit less of a difference from the network side. Uh, the pre-selection typically gets a little bit weaker since the losses through those, those kind of structures at uh, 70, 80, 100 gigahertz can be substantial. They still exist, but they can be larger. You may have the harmonic conversion we talked about before, so the same kind of issues might creep in with uh, other harmonic products. And certainly the, the older school millimeter wave harmonic mixers one might have used, there's no pre-selection at all. And there's a whole forest of these of, of significant amplitude. Um, but then there's some ADC, and that's something we haven't really focused on much yet. Um, but since we already talked about mixers and, and everything else, let's, let's spend a few minutes about how we digitize data. And this has a lot more relevance now in many ways just with the availability of high-speed digitizer cards that that are used in a number of lab setups where they have their own uh, block frequency converters to handle the RF side, but just need some good digitizers to, to process data. So if one looks at linearity of these chains, there could be, a, I guess, a wide variety of, of different possibilities. The, if the front end dominates, which one normally wants from a, uh, at least a classical design point of view, one might see a simple curve here it could get more complicated depending on the mechanisms, but let's just, just assume it's the, say some mixer diodes that are limiting. But if instead data D converters dominating the structure can be a lot more interesting, where at the very high end, you may actually get waveform clipping. So it's an extremely high order nonlinearity. And at the low end, you may get some digitizing kinds of defects uh, that cause a, a rise that appears to be an intermod product at low power level, which is a little counterintuitive initially. And there are a number of causes for that, but one of them is, is very classical and just a static uh, integral nonlinearity, as it's called, where there's a, a little bit of variance of, uh, from code to code, just as we can't isolate the, the level we're at correctly. And if you're signal amplitude happens to land in just the wrong place relative to this quasi-periodicity, one gets a little burst in this third order product kind of curve, uh, which is, is a little bit counterintuitive. And also if one's classically used to third order product curves having a slope of three with power, it actually only happens over a pretty small power range. And you get these other areas of, of even more curious uh, slopes involved there. And particularly when we talked about variable gain up front before, uh, but there's also often variable gain for the A-to-D converter, which is, if you're doing your own digitizers, of course, pretty important to understand. In a, a normal signal analyzer, the instrument's taking care of that task for you, making sure the level's appropriate uh, to avoid these problems and those problems uh, and things like that. But if you're doing it wrong, you have to pay some attention to it. There are cases where this can get confused if say spurious energy gets through some of these spur prevention tactics. Um, the A to D won't be able to figure it out. It has to figure out amplitude somehow. Uh, so there, there may be some way, sometimes when a manual control is needed and that's usually, usually available. At the front end, that's oftentimes the user has some responsibility there even in a, in a full instrument. Uh, particularly if there are wide band interferers coming in that are, are not in the current measurement range. 
Another aspect is the clocking itself of, of the converter. As in, in many ways, it really is a mixer. And we go back to some of the LO importance uh, issues we, we discussed earlier. It's not surprising. It, it will matter when we go into the many hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz sampling realm. And one little example is shown here where we're just doing a two-tone measurement and sampling it at 600 mega samples, if I remember correctly. But we have our, our nominal starting case on the left here. So we see some spurious products running around, which is, is fine and noiseful. And our tones aren't equal amplitude. <laughs> but then there was a mismatch introduced in the clock system. Someone uh, placed a, a tap into the line without compensating. And at first glance, when I think, well, that actually looks nicer um, from an aesthetic point of view. But if you look closely, the spur amplitudes really are the same. What actually happened is the noise floor came up. And what happened in this case is the waveform was distorted enough uh, that some samples were missed. And when transformed to the frequency domain, that just showed up as, a, as an elevated floor. But supposing we, we get around those problems, now, okay, we've recovered the signal, now we probably want to demodulate it. And I won't be able to go into to any level of detail on this subject, we're, we're staying on the very, very physical layer. But one, one topic we might have to consider is, well, are we on frequency? And one normally would like to synchronize time bases, but that may not be possible. Uh, so there are a number of ways of handling that before one, one can actually demodulate this uh, funny curvy looking modulation zone. Uh, one can phase lock on an IF basis, and that's sometimes done either in, well, historically hardware, but uh, more commonly in, in software now, where the, the LO is tuned to keep the, the centroid or some particular aspect of the, of the spectrum where you want it uh, in your IF window. And again, parts per billion accuracy does matter, and that's, that's uh, sometimes difficult to, to think about, but if you're moving around by, say one hertz, but your data payload is, is, is on that same scale, well, you've, you've lost a whole symbol. And a second topic is, even if we have the, to the carrier recovered properly, what about the, the data itself and the, the internal clock there, how to recover that kind of information? And there are many ways that's done, but one approach is, is using a cross correlation where one knows a particular modulation scheme uh, one can compute the time alignment to maximize this quantity, and and there were we have our um, have our clock essentially for for de demodulation. And why I mention it really goes back again to our LO uh, or our clocking to the ADC that we talked about before. If there's an awful lot of jitter on that sampling clock, uh, that's going to impact this cross correlation. How well we can interpolate it in particular. Uh, and that can lead to, to some elevated EVM. So again, the importance of, of the LO control, even if it isn't really an LO. And that brings us to another signal analysis measurement. This one's a little bit simpler. Just say I want to measure uh, adjacent channel leakage ratio, which is a, a specification in, in the 5G, 3G PP standard and as in all the previous uh, ones for 4G and so on. Uh, but let's look at this in a little detail as this will bring us back to the uncertainty topic again. But let's suppose we're, we're looking at the widest channel and this is in the higher frequency ranges up 28, 38 gigahertz, whatever. Uh, but 400 megahertz channel and the specification is minus 16 dBC, which is the essentially the channel power in this little block B relative to that in block A, the in band. And let's suppose our instrument has a max power or can support a max power of minus 10 dBm with good enough linearity. So that means to meet this specification, the signal from the DUT and the B channel has to be less than about minus 111 dBm per hertz. So we want our instrument noise floor to be considerably lower than that. And at these frequencies, that, that isn't too, too hard to do. There are many, uh, many instruments out there that can accomplish that. So that's, that's encouraging. Uh, but what's new compared to some earlier standards is some maximum uncertainties are, are specified. Um, 
plus or minus 2 dB in this higher frequency range. And so if we, we think about that a little bit, if it's really adjacent channel power ratio, that's I mean, not, not so bad. We don't really care about absolute power accuracy. So if our power sensors and power cals were, were invalid, that actually wouldn't hurt this measurement, assuming it wasn't you know, too far off or this frequency span. Uh, repeatability doesn't really matter too much either. I'm just, I can measure these at the same time. Uh, so there'll be some noise and linearity kinds of contributors to uncertainty. And we do have to calibrate for the receiver slope over this roughly 800 megahertz uh, range. Um, but that, that seems not too bad. But there's another specification for absolute power in B over, like it's a, it's a subset of this channel width, but there's an absolute power specification. They give an uncertainty allowed there of, of 3 dB. And, and this is of late last year. I'm, I'm not sure if this, this number has changed. Uh, but this is a lot more challenging measurement if you think about it, in that now, okay, it's absolute power power, now I have to transfer some power sensor accuracy to my receiver. Uh, so there are more calibration residuals to worry about. Uh, there's some repeatability concerns since I have to, uh, particularly if it's over the air, uh, between calibration time and measure time. Uh, there's some mismatch to correct for relative to the power calibration time. Uh, so this is a, a lot more challenging kind of measurement, even though they do allocate a bit more uncertainty. And shifting gears now into, into time domain, uh, if you notice, the structure doesn't look a whole lot different from the earlier pictures, aside from a little more detail. Uh, but of course, in, in practice, there is a fair amount going on, uh, particularly in, in the realm of triggering. Now, all the analyzers before have some kind of, of acquisition triggering kind of scheme that's required, but there's obviously typically a lot more choices in, in a time domain tool since you're looking for transient information, generally speaking. Uh, and importantly, there are two varieties of that kind of triggering. One is on the acquisition level, and one is when it's looking at data after the fact. So you might have some very deep memory, uh, many, many gigabytes of, of samples, and in looking for patterns in the data, for example, edges on two channels coming up at the same time, what happens next, or you're looking for glitches or, or other structures. Um, but many of the same topics come into play that we talked about before. Well, how clean are these sampling clocks? That'll, that'll affect uh, not only the ability to, to time resolve items here, since jitter here acts like a low pass filter, uh, but also distortions introducing the data from, from clocking errors. Diving a little deeper um, into what a, a real-time oscilloscope might look like. And there are, of course, many ways of doing this as well. Uh, but one approach is to have a number of slower speed A to D converters that are multiplexed together that are slightly offset in time at when their, their data was held for sampling. So of course, the, the secret part of this or the hard part of this is getting those, those little tiles correct. And there may be calibration routines internally, training signals or other things to, to handle that task, uh, temperature compensation among others. Uh, but again, controlling these LOs, so to speak, ends up being a, the per, one of the performance determining parameters. And interestingly enough, some of the high speed A to D converter chips one can buy basically have this kind of topology implemented internally. Uh, so you don't actually need a whole instrument to, to get that kind of structure sometimes. And what's also interesting from a block diagram point of view is one sees some, uh, some test structures where one actually incorporates a block down converter up front uh, to get even larger bandwidths. And these may be switched block converters to cover the whole frequency range. But you get a little even more convergence of some of these measurement structures than, than we did earlier. Uh, so the applications, of course, they're, they're all over the, the map for time domain tools and they're, they're so powerful. But one interesting application has been back to our power amplifier uh, kind of question where people are looking to acquire voltage and current waveforms at microwave and millimeter wave frequencies. Now this happens to be down in the cellular bands, but, but you get the idea. 
and what's pretty interesting from from a, a block diagram point of view is how similar this looks to how we started this this talk where you have some directional devices you have some source that needs to be switched and you just replaced the heterodyne system with essentially an oscilloscope uh, but the measurement objectives are the same and many of the same calibrations of these planes that we talked about come into play. And one can carry that a little bit further in that we can look at, use this structure to look at a modulated millimeter wave waveform. And this is just a very simple modulation, uh, BPSK, on a 220 gig waveform with frames. So what's, what's interesting is the three different time epochs that are, are sort of in place simultaneously. The, the phase modulation kind of time epoch, the frame envelope time epoch, which is the slowest of all of those, and then the RF epoch, which is now in the, uh, a couple of picosecond kind of range. But with this kind of structure, which is sort of harmonizing some of, of all the black diagrams we talked about, uh, one can, can recover uh, the modulation information. Uh, carrying that a little bit further even, what if we, we broaden this to bring in some transient aspects as well? And so let's suppose I had a, a multi-sign kind of signal uh, that's applied with an envelope on it, some kind of uh, framing envelope uh, to a transmitter. And we're interested in the time evolution of distortion products. We'd like to do some match correction. Uh, we'd like to do a little comparison of the input waveform. So what, is, what does that sort of mean? Well, time evolution, so that says transient nature. Uh, so we're gonna need some kind of triggering help. We're gonna need some kind of waveform memory. That makes sense. Uh, we wanna do match correction and some input ratioing. So, okay, we'll probably need some multiple receivers and they are gonna have to be linear. And we're looking at distortion products. So the frequency plan of the stimulus and receiver are different. Uh, so we're no longer in, certainly not in a small signal S parameter realm, that, that's quite, quite certain. And so one can, can imagine an, an instrument and accomplish these kind of things, which as you would guess is, is bringing together some wideband IF concepts, some deep memory, uh, multiple receivers with some kind of signal generation capability and some means of incorporating triggering and modulation. And so here's, here's such a measurement. And the, on the lower part of the screen is really sort of the, I guess the evolving time epochs that are, are interested. There's some global start trigger. So we're gonna power up this transmitter at some, some start time here. Um, bias is gonna start, the signal is gonna start. And then the, the frame blocks are gonna start propagating to the, to the transmitter. Uh, one on the initial one we're gonna look at and then a, about the eighth one we're gonna look at. In the, the graph, we show the main, one of the main multi-sign outputs. So this is sort of the carrier if we wanna think of it that way or part of the modulation. And that's in green and so there's a little bit of overshoot at the start of the, of the frame, that's, that's interesting. And the blue is just the noise for the instrument, so that's less interesting. Um, but if you look at the, the dashed curves, those are, are the intermodulation products. And the red one's measured in this first frame. And you see, okay, it peaks up near where the, the main tone has, has an overshoot set. One could rationalize why that should happen. And there's a, a little bit of evolution over the scale of 10 nanoseconds or 15 nanoseconds or so. But one looks at the, the purple line, which is what's going on in this eighth frame. One again sees this peak up near the overshoot point. Uh, that sort of makes sense, but the amplitude is, is quite a bit lower. And what ended up happening in this particular system was a, a driver amplifier warmed up as it went through these first eight frames. Its gain dropped a little bit so the final stage was compressed a little bit less and hence a little lower in terms of distortion. But it was by combining a lot of these, these architectural thoughts in, in this measurement, we were able to accomplish this kind of measurement uh, that brought uh, both time and frequency aspects, uh, distortion and match correction and, and the other network and signal analysis concepts together into it. 
so to, to summarize, there certainly as, as we're moving into these, these higher frequency realms, there are changing power budgets. Linearity presents some interesting cases, may not affect uncertainty directly, but one has to think about it more and more. Calibration needs are changing more with media than anything else, uh, but that's being driven by the, the integration requirements of, of those applications. And across the, the instrument types, there are, I guess, a few recurring themes. Uh, one being the increasing importance of, of clock and LO, purity and stability, uh, and how one modulates that, that waveform. Wideband digitizers are ubiquitous in all the instruments and of course as a standalone kind of tool. And understanding their linearity, sometimes the other vendors do it for you, but um, taking that into account may sometimes be needed. Uh, the centrality of repeatability and drift uh, as an uncertainty mechanism uh, and understanding how uh, things like mechanical mounting schemes uh, interact with this as well as even mechanics of connection schemes. And it's sort of a tangential in a little bit, but the importance of how data is used in the end and how some of these uncertainty mechanisms propagate through it. It may be some of the transform related items we talked about, which are increasingly important where uh, correlation comes into play. It may be simpler, such as a, a nonlinear transform. For example, a device modeler may want to express everything in Y parameters for, for their purposes. Uh, but that's a nonlinear relationship from the S parameter space and the uncertainties propagate a little bit differently. And all of those impact uh, the, the acquisition needs and how the measurements are set up. But with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and happy to entertain any questions. Hey John, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, let me just quickly bring up this first one. Um, how does frequency phase LO mismatch manifest in data recovery? As in demodulation, I assume that that's referring yeah, to? Yeah, totally, that's what it's referring to. Yeah, that's, that's actually an interesting one. Um, there are a, yeah, a whole lot of, of places that shows up. The, if there are um, phase distortions that say uh, impact uh, the modulation envelope itself, then the data curve that comes out will be misshapen. So identifying a simple edge, symbol edge gets to be more difficult. You may miss the edge entirely. You may sample part way up uh, a symbol transition when you shouldn't be. Um, so that leads to, well, EVM spreading if one looks at the constellation diagram. If you have linearity issues, um, that can certainly compress a symbol, uh, particularly for uh, some of the multi-level kind of signaling schemes that gets to be even more severe. So the whole constellation can compress or expand. And certain uh, phase distortions and, and depending on the detection scheme, um, other bias distortions can rotate uh, that whole spectrum. And what that all boils back down to identifying the symbol edge correctly so you sample in, in the right part of the symbol. Okay. Great, and then uh, so one other question here. Can you comment on uh, generating nonlinear models for system simulation? Oh, well, that's a big topic. Uh, <laughs> well, if you can just, uh, just, yeah, maybe lead someone to uh, the appropriate yeah. area to research. Yeah, there, there have been uh, a number of, of DML talks in recent years actually on, on the nonlinear generation. Uh, professors Roblin, Schurz, and, and Pedro among them. And they're, uh, uh, Jan Verspect, whose paper I said earlier, are good places to start. There are a lot of different uh, philosophies there. One is based on the premise that there is a core to a to a model that's largely DC based and the DC behavior determines all the nonlinearities. And then there are RF parasitics that surround it. And those from a use point of view, uh, sort of determine the, the nonlinear behavior you see in practice. So in that school of thought, they focus on, on a, 
on heavy low frequency and DC characterization to capture memory effects, capture all the IV distortions and everything else. And then they carefully try to go after all the RF parasitics separately and create a separable model uh, that way. Another school of thought is a, a full black box kind of approach where you characterize this whole RF microwave blob uh, as something that uh, responds to different stimuli in the RF and DC space. And in that case, one ha would do a, a stimulus map over different, say, RF drive amplitudes simultaneously with different bias conditions and fill in as much of that surface space as you can. And there's a, a large a body of literature on that kind of topic on how to efficiently cover that n-dimensional space uh, and get a, a predictable model over both local ranges, say if you're only going to move a little bit around a specific operating point, or much larger ranges uh, where one wants to predict how the device can act in a, in a number of different applications. So there, there are probably other schools of thought. Those are the two I'm most familiar with. Um, but they can, can both yield uh, pretty good results. Um, we've got a couple of other questions here as well. Um, with the advent of wideband digitizers, do you see the blending of separate measurement devices like DNAs and oscilloscopes? Um, that wouldn't be surprising if, if there's more of a convergence. I, I, the, as we've already seen in say how the, the various instruments act today as opposed to you know, a decade or so ago. You see oscilloscopes that are doing open short load calibrations uh, with couplers and you see VNAs with deep memory for capturing transients. Uh, yeah, so it wouldn't be surprising if, if there was, was a pretty significant degree of conversions. Okay, and I think um, we may just have enough time for one more question. And this is, uh, how does the digitum, digitize the noise performance affect the, affect the performance? Is it a functional bandwidth? Um, of course, if, yeah, if you're looking on a, um, trying to acquire the entire available digitizing bandwidth for whatever reason, its noise floor is going to be higher than if you, you, you're after less of it by a Fourier means or, or some other approach. Now on an, on an equivalent bandwidth point of view, uh, typically a faster digitizer is gonna have a higher floor than a slower digitizer, uh, just for, for certain technology reasons and how they handle the, the sampling clocks. That discrepancy is, is decreasing over time as, as the technologies get better and the internal calibrations get better. Uh, but there probably will be a little bit of a noise floor hit on a per unit bandwidth basis if you sample faster than, too much faster uh, than you need to. Okay, great. Um, we have one other question here, more relating to logistics and the availability of the, of the slides or recording. <clears throat> and gosh, maybe you can comment on that, whether uh, how people get access to that. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned before, this uh, talk was recorded and yep. the link to the video as well as the slide set will be sent to all the registrants. So everybody here will get it. Great. Um, with that, I'd like to again thank you, uh, Dr. John Martin, for a great presentation. I think it had a lot of people uh, tied up in your, uh, your presentation. So uh, uh, again, thank you. And uh, I think I'd like to close the, uh, the presentation at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the attendees and the participation. Thank you everybody and uh, stay tuned because we'll be back uh, next month with our next talk. And uh, yeah, hope to see you all there. And thanks again to Dr. John Martins. This was a very good talk, very informative. So thank you. Thanks, John. All right. See you next time. Thanks. Bye. Right. Bye.